Mr. Hendon? Here. Ms. Lewis? Here. Mr. Olson? Here. Ms. Redden? Here. Ms. Reynolds? Here. You? Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have anyone here from the public who are anyone uh, other than library staff and connected people? All right, I don't need to give that portion of it. Um, at this time, I would like to move that the board enter executive uh, session under Ohio Revised Code 121.22 G3 to confer with our attorney concerning disputes involving the library regarding pending or imminent court action and I'm asking for a second on this motion. Second. Okay, thank you. So we meet your roll call. Yeah, and now we'd like to ask those. Got to do a roll call. We need to do a roll call. Okay. Uh, Ms. Allen? Yes, agree. Mr. Hendon? Here. Uh, Ms. Lewis? Yes. Mr. Olson? Aye. Ms. Redden? Yes. Ms. Reynolds? Yes. Okay, now we're in executive session. We're so. now in executive session. We ask all those who are not on the executive board of trustees to leave. Jeff, please stand. I'm going to move that the city council. I move that the board exits the executive There's session. Is there a second? Second. second. Uh, Ms. Allen? Yes. Mr. Harding? Yes. Mr. Hendon? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Mr. Olson? Yes. Ms. Redden? Yes. Ms. Reynolds? Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. This time I would like to um, move, uh, move forward with our agenda and ask the executive director for your information report. Okay. We are having some uh, problems with our board doc, so we'll see if it loads. Can you hear me now? Yes. And move it over to this side. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm very loud. So usually it's fine. It's usually fine. I am loud. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Jalen. Thank you, everyone. I'm Paula Bramheger, the Eva Jane Romain Coombe Director for our library. Going to kick off my report with some information about public library levies across the state. Ohioans approved 86% of them on May 2. Um, six of the seven public library levies on the local ballots around Ohio were approved. The successful library ballot issues included five renewals one renewal with an increase, and the six levies passed by a significant margin. The average voter approval was 72%. Going on to a little legislative update. On Monday, May 22, we did host our uh, biannual legislative dinner for our Hamilton County delegation of the Ohio General Assembly. The event is intended to give our state legislators the opportunity to ask us about current library initiatives and tell us about their upcoming goals and priorities. The main topics included, of course, the current state budget and also our library's facility master plan. State legislators in attendance, Representative Abrams, Denson, Isaacson, Seitz, and Thomas. Speaking of the state budget, that is in full swing right now. So on April 26, the Ohio House of Representatives passed their version of the state budget bill, HB 33, 77 to 19. After passage by the House, the bill moved over to the Ohio Senate, and the Senate introduced their ver version of that budget last week. The Senate Finance Committee will hold hearings on their version of the budget, and it is planned, and I think it still holds, that they're going to vote on that on the Senate floor this Thursday on June 15th. The bill continues to recommend funding for public library fund at the same level as what was proposed in the governor's original ballot. Uh, ba uh, original proposal and the House proposal both 1.7 percent of permanent law. Even though the Senate version includes a significant income tax cut, the estimates continue contained in their budget related to the PLF remain consistent with a 505 million fiscal year 24 and 530 million in fiscal year 25. Just for some context, that's all of the money for all 251 libraries across the state, public libraries across the state, not just for us. So we get a portion of that, but that is the overall budget for the PLF currently as it stands. We continue to advocate 
do, uh, to contact the Senate and advocate for maintaining the PLF funding at that minimum of 1.7 of the general revenue fund. We certainly thank the Senate for their support of the PLF at 1.7 and ask that they support increasing the PLF percentage if there's any additional change in the state budget that causes a reduction in the library fund. So if they reduce something that reduces the GRF, our percentage would naturally reduce and we're asking them to keep that in mind. Support funding for public library facilities. We urge senators support public libraries with funding to update critical needs, roofs, elevators, HVAC systems, we can certainly relate to that, flooring and security <laughs> systems. Support increasing the competitive bidding thresh threshold for public libraries. The House's version increased public uh, library competitive bidding threshold from 50,000 to 75, and it includes a provision to increase that threshold by 3% annually after 2024. Competitive bidding for public libraries under ORC section 337541 has not been updated in more than a decade. This change would give public libraries more flexibility in making improvements, and we thank the Senate for maintaining the language added by the House to increase this threshold. And uh, restoration of the option for replacement levies, the House's version of the state budget eliminated the authority of local governments like ours, to levy replacement property tax levies beginning in 25. The Senate version of the state budget restores that option, including uh, for local governments, including libraries, to utilize it for a replacement levy. Please note that the Senate included language to expand the back-to-school sales tax holiday for the last two weeks in August, starting in 2024. The language included by the Senate to reimburse counties, local governments, and the PLF for any lost revenue. I've heard some coverage of that on local radio stations recently, so we certainly thank the Senate for holding us harmless from loss of revenue due to this expanded tax holiday. A couple of other notes, uh, Urban Library Council Conference in New York, LJ Summit in Columbus in early May. I joined our public library leaders from across North America as we convened the Urban Library Council's two-day CEO roundtable in New York at the recently renovated uh, library there, which used to be referred to as the Mid-Manhattan Branch. Um, we, uh, presentations focus on adult education, workforce and economic development, and AI including a session <coughs> titled AI, Bridging the Gap Between Excited and Scared, yes. <laughs> Libraries as Spaces for Innovation and Productivity and Rehearsing for Change. The NYPL Branch Location mm -hmm. Tech Connect floor, which is the library is actually a five floor building, so they have one entire floor that is their Tech Connect floor, was particularly interesting to see. It featured multiple rooms designed for workforce and technology training, plus a studio creative space. Um, that really was boosting, uh, was boasting up-to-date equipment for making music, podcasts, and more. That was fascinating. In April, I, along with Assistant Public Services Director Tara Kressler, who I think is maybe here, there's Tara, and uh, Public Safety Manager Ebony Gordon attended the Safety and Security Summit sponsored by Library Journal. Just up the road in Columbus, Ohio, we had a branch manager, Kaya Bergen, who spoke on a panel, security staffing models, police, social work, and everything in between. I served on the advisory and planning board for this event, and feedback was strong. That is essential for continued training, best practices, and awareness focused on the increasing security challenges public libraries and staff members uh, across the uh, country are facing, like every public space that has increased for us quite a bit, particularly since the end of uh, the pandemic and more people are out and about. Ending here with diversity, equity, inclusion, and culture update. In May, we completed parts three and four of our DEI curriculum, training over 80% of our staff. This summer, we're going to shift our efforts to workplace culture, focusing on caring for conflict, which includes staff training that will place emphasis on having productive and necessary, though sometimes tough, conversations. Beginning June 9th, we rolled out our Coffee Friday initiative. This is a new initiative to engage in build rapport with our regular customers at the main library. So we hosted and had some coffee that we gave uh, on Friday morning, and we'll keep you posted on that. We had a lot of takers. That we did have several people that asked us where the donuts were. It's just <laughs> coffee right now, so we're doing our best. Um, what time do you do that? We do it at 10 a.m. right when we open. Yes. Yeah, just after the course open, there you go. So we'll keep you posted. We're not sure if we're going to do that uh, maybe once a month. We'll let you know, but we're just trying to <laughs> raise awareness of that. And I do hope that AI does not decide that they can replace the board trustees. Oh, 
Never. <laughs> never. Never judge. Never. Oppose that. Never. Here, here. Yes, you oppose that. Yes. We are on record that way. I don't have any action items, so I will turn it back over to you, Judge Allen. What I'm doing next, I'm asking uh, Mr. Hendrick to present the facilities, finance, and audit committee report. Thank you, Judge Allen. Uh, <clears throat> the Phil's Facilities, Finance, and Audit Committee met on June 9th, Reading Branch, Committee Chair Robert Hendon, Committee Members Greg Olson, Diane Cunningham Reddin, along with Board Member Davian Allen, along with attendants. Several staff members of Paul Abraham Heger and Molly DeFossi were also in attendance. It is a recommendation of the committee that the board take the following action. Main library project update. <clears throat> the framing and drywall work on the first floor renovation is in process. Glass panels for the stair rail are in production. The electric has been installed on the plaza. The barricades around the construction of the plaza were recently removed so the sidewalk work can begin. The work on the interior finishes and furniture selections is expected to be completed by late September. The library continues to work with Kramer Design on the thematic element to serve as entry for the children's area in the first floor. Now we need to confirm the following change orders to modify our interior, interior renovation GMP for Turner Construction. And you have a list of the change orders there. I will not read them in the uh, because this is quite a lengthy report. Does anybody have any questions about the change orders? The work is complete in the north place of Estville. On the north parking lot, the adjustment to the fence space, wall, and mirror finish items are expected to be completed by the end of July. <clears throat> Ongoing maintenance at Coryville. Work on the Coryville branch is almost complete. The temporary certification of occupancy is expected in the next two weeks, and the reopening is scheduled shortly after that. There will be additional items installed later this summer and scheduled at our convenience. I confirm the following change orders to modify Coryville branch maintenance GMP for Pepper Construction and you have a list of those in your documents. Hyde Park Branch Elevator Replacement and Renovation. Work on the soil remediation for the elevator installation has been finalized and is in progress. All the demolition is complete and most of the new electric has been roughed in. We expect to have an updated substantial completion date by August 2023 20, board meeting. All right, we need to confirm the following change orders to modify the Hyde Park Branch Elevator Replacement and Renovation for the GMP for Turner Construction. All right, the West End Branch Renovation. The demolition phase of the project was completed in a timely manner without major issues. During specific trade per permitting, issues were noted regarding the gas meter placement and the routing of stormwater and sewer line. Both these items have been resulted in some redesign with corresponding change orders. One of the two presented below. Upon the commencement of the construction, an issue arose with the existing conditions of the building and installation of the <coughs> new electric lines. <coughs> work was stopped while Turner and Emerson worked through details. As of the beginning of June, the project is back on track. Completion date remains the same. All right, then we need to confirm the fine change orders to modify the West End Branch Renovation GMP for Turner Construction. All right, Price Hill Parkalette. The construction of the hardscape and landscape for the project is complete, and the installation of public art is underway. We need to confirm the fine change orders to modify the agreement with ADELT for the Price Hill Parkalette project. Revision of the 2023 estimated resource and annual appropriations. General Fund. In December 2022, the board approved providing an affordable parking stipend to assist employees in offsetting the additional costs associated with working in the main library and other locations that do not offer parking with no charge to employees. Although the parking stipend was included in the original appropriations in December, it was added to insurance benefits. Now, we confirm the following appropriation change to reclassify the amounts incurred for February 2023 to June 2023, uh, and you can see the general fund changes. Approve the following appropriation change to reclassify the amounts expected to be incurred the remainder of the year. <coughs> you can see that. Now, for, now we need to, uh, I need a, I, I move that we accept the uh, change orders. I second. <coughs> 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Now, for information only, audit response to resolutions requesting certification for current tax value valuation. At the May 25th, 2023 special meeting of the Board of Trustees, six resolutions were approved requesting tax valuation at three different mileage rates for both, millage rates for both 10-year <laughs> term and a continuing term. Resolutions were submitted to the auditor on May 25th, 2023. Response was received on June the 5th, 2023. The table below summarizes the responses. Okay, we have for one mill, the estimated annual cost of 100,000 market value is $25. One and a half mill is $43. And the 1.8 mill is $55. Library requests that we received information regarding continuing levy terms in Hamilton County. Based on our review, many essential services such as police information center and other local farm police services are on an ongoing term. In addition, the vast majority of school district expense levies are ongoing with the most districts having multiple. For example, since I public schools have seven continuing between voted on between seven, 1976 and 2000. They have a 28 year bond issue approved in 2023 and three more recent emergency levies with various terms ranging from five to 10 years. Another example, Deer Park City Schools has 13 continuing levies voted on between 1976 and 2021, and one bond issue in 37 years. The, uh, one other item of interest is CHPL is unique in, among our peers in Ohio when it comes to funding. We're the last major metro library to seek local funding many years after the others. They have moved to a more stable, reliable model and continue local funding that ensures the continuation of library services to the community without primary dependence on the fluctuating state funding. In addition, we're the only major metro in Ohio without any debt. That's amazing. The table compares our funding sources distributed between local and state funding with other large systems in Ohio. Mr. Hedden, before you move on to that, and you gave the numbers for estimated revenue, those yeah. dollars are per year. I think it's kind of important to say that in the record, too. Right. That's, that's the, that's the, the annual estimated. Year. Annual estimated. And it's not per month, but per year. Right. So, for the public's information. Madam Chair, could I be recognized? I uh, wanted to make a point of inquiry. Are we looking at any recommendations from our consultant that's looking at this levy? Are we going to get something like that before we vote on this? Yes. Okay. Because I think it's important to have some data around some of this, so we're definitely interested. Yeah, okay. so the July 18th meeting is a special meeting. So between now and then with these, this bit of information and also once we get a final confirmation about what the Senate mm -hmm. and the House are going to come to for the state budget, but yes, data is good and it is going to be coming. Okay. All right, <clears throat> moving on the new Forest Park branch. The groundbreaking was held on May 25th, 2013, or 2023, with several board members, elected officials, represented from the construction and design teams, along with many enthusiastic community members and library staff in attendance. The site work started almost immediately, as with some of our other projects. Unforeseen conditions were discovered early in the project, with the existence of buried basements in the site. How can we miss buried basements? It was unbelievable. It was very we saw we saw a copy of where the test drills were made, and they just just missed them. It's crazy. It's unbelievable. It was nuts. Uh, there were te several test drill spots during the due diligence process. These two areas, each 42 by 42 feet, were not discovered. The basements were only under the center sections of the former building of the property. Library is working with Turner to determine the project implications. Well, do you have any update on that that is shareable at this point, or are we still in investigation? Well, we our, our preliminary numbers are under 80,000 to do that fix, but you'll see that change order next month yeah. or in August. Um, there is still a there could still be um, some things they find under the basements once they get in there, but we're hopeful that that's not the case. <clears throat> 
All right, energy retrofit Geiler lawsuit. We just discussed that. Uh, another round of mediation has been mid, mid July. Opportunity for branch replacement in Miami Township. Represents a three River School District reached out to the library regarding the potential of building a new building on the lot in front of the school campus. Library is investigating the feasibility along with estimated costs associated with acquiring building and maintaining the property. We intend to continue this discussion with school district later this year. Now the problem with that location is it's in a floodplain. Yes. And that books don't like water, I don't think. No, they don't. <laughs> no, they don't. All right, moving on, the Delhi Township branch expansion renovation. The library recently met with representative of Delhi Township administration regarding possibilities for expanding a library property. Potential for connecting the parking, the neighbor, neighboring park, as well as opportunities for shared parking. We continue to explore design ideas and site improvement requirements. Deer Park Branch. The installation issues associated with decorative metal tubes and the facade have been satisfactory result. Wall Hills Branch Accessibility. The resolution remaining punch items have been very slow. We continue to work with Megan Construction on these issues. Ongoing maintenance planning. We originally, the, as originally planned, the bulk of the majority, the bulk of the major financial master plan work was front-loaded to the first five years of the 10-year implementation schedule. As we approach the end of those first five years, we're evaluating the most critical maintenance work that needs to be completed. We'll be revisiting after previous, as previously discussed. Avondale maintenance, which will be included in the waterproofing for HVAC corrections. Recently, the Norwood branch experienced the collapse of the interior lining of the chimney. <coughs> Norbert, along with several other branches, have HVA systems over 50 years old. We're working with a mechanical engineer to identify the scope of work of these projects so we can determine the funding needs. Sharonville Refresh. The Sharonville branch will be the seventh branch to receive a refresh since 2020. As a reminder, a refresh includes flooring, updating finishes, limited furniture and shelving replacement while incorporating the features of the next gen library as able. The goal is to begin as to refresh late September and should take six to eight weeks. The work will be done by library facilities team. The expected budget for this project is estimated at $450,000, which includes carpet, furniture, supplies, and minor consulting. 2020, 2022 audit update. The audit is almost finished. Library staff are working to complete the annual com comprehensive financial report. We have not been made aware of any issues. The auditors will still send out a draft opinion, GSA, GAGS opinion of the board, each board member. The opinion will include the option to request a meeting within five days of receiving the mail. The board may waive post audit meeting at their discretion. <coughs> now, Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting Award. We were recently notified the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada has awarded the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting to the Library for our annual comprehensive financial report for the fiscal year ended December 31, 2021. The report has been judged by an impartial panel to meet the high standards of the program, which includes demonstration and constructive spirit of full disclosure, to clearly communicate its financial story and motivate potential users, users and use groups to read the report. The certificate of treatment is the highest form of recognition in this area of government, accounting, and financial reporting. It's attainable represents a significant accomplishment by the government and its management. Libraries receive this report every year since the first year it was completed in mid-1990s. Congratulations, Molly. Yes. Yeah. That, that's Molly DeFossi for everybody. <laughs> and that, and that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Hendon. I'm not going to turn things over to Ms. Redden or the uh, Thank you, Jim.
Judge Allen. Uh, this report was compiled by Kyla Harden. Thank you, Kyla. Policy updates. A goal for 2023 is to continue to review and update policies in an effort to ensure that they are clear, concise, and reflect the current practices of the library. We request approval of the attached policy updates and changes. The revised policy is attached as follow. follows. Flexible work arrangement policy. Proposed policy is Exhibit A, and the current policy is Exhibit B. So the flexible work arrangement policy, we are recommending a revision to the current flexible, flexible work arrangement policy that will meet the needs of a public service organization while still providing some flexibility to staff whose roles allow for remote work. Beginning in September, eligible staff can work from a remote location for a maximum of eight hours a week rather than the current allowance of 16 hours. Please note a very small percent of our staff, approximately 10%, are eligible for remote work as the vast majority of our service requires in-person staffing. Is there any discussion or questions? I, I'd like to ask, um, so are, if we're looking at 10%, how, how, how many people is that roughly? Is that 80 or somewhere? 80 people, okay. right. And of 80, those, 80, 80, 80. 80. of those people, I mean, is there, a reasoning for why we're scaling back those hours because my understanding the first iteration of the policy um, it there was a lot of language about trying to ensure that we are you know thinking about the work-life balance of individuals I know we're changing some of that language um, but I'm curious as to um, kind of the rationale well, I kind of can certainly speak to it. From my perspective, if you have um, more than 700 people who come to work every day, there's a bit of an, an equity issue around some portion of your staff not having to come to work. So giving people the eight hours, which I think I was talking to a couple of other nonprofits, many people have started to come back to eight hours. Like you still have this flexibility, your job is still that, but it is a service organization. So to have people who are coming in person is probably a little bit more essential for us. And if you're just like more of an, an office environment or an environment where the vast majority of your people can take advantage of this if they would like to, we have the vast majority of our folks cannot take advantage of it mm -hmm. because they simply have to be there in person. I think the other thing is um, we have certainly seen the benefits of having people in person because of all the collaborative work we're doing right now. You know, all of the building yep. we're doing and all of the various things that we are trying to handle where it's cross-divisional, it's just a little bit more likely for us to be able to catch everything and keep moving forward when we have people physically together more. I, Kyle, I don't know if you have anything to add. No, I would agree with all of that. Um, the, 80, uh, the 80 people who are able to do remote work are really our support departments and seeing us on 90% of our folks are on site. You know, many times our support folks are needed in person and uh, we just want to ensure that we find a little bit of middle ground in this policy. Um, we created this policy back in, yes. I want to say 18. It was before the pandemic. It was before the pandemic yes. and we've evaluated our needs as a public service organization, evaluated our staff's needs who are on site 100% of the time and have really found that um, eight hours is uh, just a better fit for the organization than the 16 hours. And to Kyla's point about when it was created, we went with 16 hours and at that time, I would say we were nowhere near 80 people who could do it. We probably had like 10 to 20 people who could do it because the technology was different in 2018 than it is now. So when we went with 16, it was a small, smaller number by far than now where we have more and it's a little bit larger impact in terms of trying to have in-person meetings. So it is worth noting we were on the cutting edge of work from home back in 2018 and it has um, evolved for us like everyone else. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question a yes, bit? Thanks. Yeah, but it's a good point and we certainly do adhere to allow, uh, you know, making sure we're allowing staff to have that work-life balance. Has there been pushback? Um, we haven't heard a lot of pushback from, we've heard um, some thank yous and, you know, some appreciation for the change um, or for the proposed change. Um, we haven't heard a lot of pushback at this point. Time, um, but I think we've done uh, worked hard to explain the why to provide uh, FAQs around uh, the transition. We've given staff quite a bit of time to adjust to this, so yeah. mm -hmm. the change doesn't occur until the Tuesday after Labor Day, um, and we let staff know about this in April. So we really tried to give some transition time 
uh, for folks to, to make that change. And, and does this also rely on trust? In other words, we don't have spyware as to whether or not they're really <laughs> sitting there, or, and also so it's based upon that trust and outcome. Yeah, we're not counting keystrokes. Okay. No. Right. <laughs> no. We have accountability measures, but yeah. Yeah, we, we do have accountability but trust to that. Right, but we trust ourselves. And I, I know it's a delicate conversation, but considering the library is a major employer in the Cincinnati and Hamilton County area, as all of you know, there's a lot of conversation right now and efforts from many groups to bring folks back to work due to the income tax crisis the city of Cincinnati is facing, et cetera. So I think it's important that we look at this really critically over time and look at how we're doing our part um, to contribute to that. So I appreciate the thoughtfulness that's gone into it, but also recognize that this is a little tricky and we're a very large employer in the county and we need to make sure that we're thinking through that. So thanks. And so we can let our employees know that the outside world's also looking in and we're they are. Yeah. taking a leap toward accommodation and, and you've considered all those factors and I think that we've come up with the right Perfect number. Yeah. Right now. I, I, I was just going to ask one more thing. I know um, at the bottom there, um, I, I, I don't know if we could pull that oh, up, sure. um, but I know there was a line kind of talking about how, you know, right, this isn't a benefit necessarily and it can be taken away at any point. Um, so I'm wondering that added language, is there, um, is there a reason to believe that these this time is not being utilized well, or what's kind of the no, rationale for that? That language is in there um, because we do want to reserve the right if it's not actually much. Mm -hmm. Well, the individual, that individual isn't meeting accountability measures, or if the department needs change, um, we do want to reserve the right to um, change course and bring folks back. Yeah, that's right. So the employee that has a, it's a privilege, not a right to these Correct. eight hours, yeah. so I think right. employees need to know that. And again, our original policies from 2018 was probably written in a manner where like the 15 people that were doing it, we knew exactly what they were doing because it was so few and that's just mm -hmm. many more. So putting that kind of added language <clears throat> is kind of an evolution mm -hmm. because ours was not developed during the pandemic or after the pandemic. It was in place before all of these advances and changes too, which is great for us, but it does require some review and consideration. Sure. Okay. okay, can I get a motion to uh, accept the policy changes? Make the motion. A second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the rest of the report is information only. Staff and Retiree Recognition Program. The 10th Annual Staff Recognition Program was, helped on, was held on Sunday, May 21st at the Culping Center. This year, service recognition pins were given to all staff reaching a five-year increment anniversary. During this year's event, Ebony Gordon, the public safety manager, was awarded the Rookie of the Year for her outstanding performance in her first 18 months with the library. Kathy Sebastian, children's librarian at the Miami Township Branch, was recognized as the Impact Award and Bunny Daner Prize recipient for her exceptional contributions and service. Thank you to Casey Titzinger, Senior Branch Manager at our Delhi Branch, Ella Hewler, Popular Library Manager, and Lacey Worley, Mount Healthy Branch Manager, for going above and beyond to coordinate this fun event for staff and to all staff who were able to attend and celebrate all of our accomplishments in the past year. National Library Workers' Day. April 25th was National Library Workers' Day where we celebrate all library workers. This is a day that communities across the country recognize the valuable contributions made by library staff. National Library Workers Day honors our staff for their commitment to serve with excellence. This year, the staff morale team sponsored the activities throughout the week, encouraging staff to connect with each other and take part in the celebration. Senior leadership created themed baskets to raffle off to staff during each hour on National Library Workers Day. I have a point of information very quickly. I want to thank Kyla and her team in HR for the staff recognition event. Mm -hmm. Trustees who were able to come and um, Ms. Redden and uh, retired Judge Allen who were our dynamic duo of MC at that event. <laughs> it was fantastic. So thank you all. Appreciate that. We had a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. She's a part-time comedian. <laughs> It's all about the mic. It's all about the microphone. <laughs> uh, and that's the end of my report.
It's not on the right way. Back are we done with everything? We're done. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for that report, Thank you. Ms. Redden. I'd like to turn things over now to Mr. Olson to present the Technology Committee. Thank you, Mr. Judge. This Technology Committee um, report is from Holbrook Sample. Um, Karen Davis, Integrated Library Systems Manager, uh, started working for the library in 1994 as a student shelver at the Marymount Branch. Over the years, she's worked in various roles, including a library services assistant, Youth Services Librarian and Branch Manager at several branches across the county from Bond Hill to Loveland. She was managing the Loveland branch just prior to accepting her latest position as the Integrated Library Systems Manager in November of 2018. Projects and programs in which Karen has been involved during her tenure include Library Card Challenge Campaigns, Tomorrow's Manager Program, and the Management Academy. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Hi. Thanks Welcome. for having me. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to share a few updates that's going on in the technology division. Um, since we have gone late buying free, we wanted to evaluate all of the hardware that's associated with collecting payments. Uh, so last year there was a team that got together to look at different options that were available. Um, a vendor was selected then at TBS. And so now we are looking at implementation of that. Now this is a big project because it involves lots of different divisions and departments uh, coordinating between service and technology and fiscal. And um, so all these, this one point of sale is going to replace like pay for print and PC reservation and all the devices that are the self checks. So it's gonna take a little while to work through. We wanna make sure we're thoughtful and thorough with training and implementation, uh, but we're hoping to be uh, implemented by the end of the year. Um, another update on devices that's going on is computer services. They're working on replacing towers and all-in-one computers. They're finished working on the towers and they're now working through all the all-in-ones. Um, they're hoping to be done with that in the next few weeks. Uh, when they're done with that, they'll have replaced about 800 devices. So that's a big project that they've been working on. Uh, not only have uh, physical devices have been upgraded, but we're also working on some software upgrades as well. Computer services is working through updating all of staff and public devices to Microsoft Office 2021. Uh, the public devices were updated in, on June 4th, and that went very smoothly. And so now we're gradually ro rolling through all of the public devices. Staff can opt in to just kind of do it on their own if they want. I did it myself last week and it was very painless. <laughs> um, another software update that we've done recently is our Sierra, R-I-L-S. We updated a few weeks ago to its newest version. Um, the benefit of opting to that now is that we are now eligible to implement LX Starter, which is Innovative's base for its kind of new library ecosystem that they're working on. Well, we're not looking to move forward in that direction quite <laughs> yet. Um, LX Starter will allow us to hopefully um, send out more modern um, notices for holds and overdues. Uh, right now, the notices that get sent out kind of look like ransom notices. <laughs> <laughs> so we want them to be, <laughs> so we want them to be, you know, a little more welcoming and friendly. <laughs> Please bring your right, yeah. <laughs> so um, since this is new. <laughs> With Innovative, um, they're kind of rolling that out in cohorts. So we're looking to see what cohort we're going to be with. And so we'll find out hopefully soon what timing will look like for that. But I'm hopeful that testing will start relatively soon for that. And then we can move to something bigger and better. Um, the last thing I have is Newsdex. So Newsdex is a um, index of local newspapers that was developed in-house about 30 years ago. Um, it's been maintained all that time. Not many new things have been added to it since we have things like ProQuest and other electronic databases that are doing current papers. Um, but some of the, uh, the entries in here are very, very old and there's been a lot of manpower going into uh, building that database and so we definitely want to keep it. Um, for about the past 10 years, it's been running on a product from Innovative um, Millennium, which at the time, 10 years ago, was an older product of theirs. And the past few years, they've just been supporting it less and less. So which each, each Sierra update, we've been concerned that Newsdex will crash and we won't be able to recover it. So we really have felt pressure to get it on something that's more stable. 
So the IELTS department and the genealogy and local history department work together to find something that will be functional for staff and for customers. Um, just a few weeks ago, we launched um, the new version of it. It's running on Dataset, which is a kind of an open source software for gathering together information like that. That transition went very well, um, and that's running right now. Um, with, with the benefit of not only is it stable, <laughs> you can access it, but we also can have uh, Google Analytics on it, so we can actually get better look at how much is being used. Um, so I think that'll be helpful in kind of knowing I, what our customers are looking for. So I think that's about all I had. So thanks again for giving me a few minutes of your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you for your service. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Huh? Thank you. If there are any questions, I'll add two quick things. Karen noted that we are replacing the PCs. So uh, PCs are a, a little like our buildings. We use them until they don't work anymore. And then we're like, oh, they don't work. But on the places we have replaced the PCs, the PC usage has increased. Anecdotally, we believe it's because they go faster and they're better. So it is an example of when we talk about supporting things, you can make do with a lot, but it is not until you get a better version that you're like, wow, this is so much more functional. So I think it's important to note they've been doing a lot of work on that. And news decks, I do want to note um, that is a unique product and it does obituaries. So obituaries are generally regarded oh, by reference databases as advertisements, so they're not generally indexed. Mm -hmm. So that's why the genealogy department is so committed to news decks, and genealogy, genealogists use it all the time. If you search like ProQuest and you're trying to find an obituary, it's not as likely. So our news decks does a lot it's around superior. obituaries. Sure yeah. Is. yeah, obituaries for local. So I just wanted to make sure that all their hard work and the years of keeping oh, news decks oh, together, that's oh, quite valuable. <laughs> yeah. If you know any genealogists who use a library, mention news decks and they'll know right away what you're talking about. So thank you. Yeah. On to the Story Center of Technology. Uh, the Story Center, which will be located on the second floor of the main library's south building, is soon to be renovated library. It is being developed by a cross-departmental team led by the Genealogy and Local History Department. IT's involvement includes selecting the technology for collecting, preserving, and showcasing community narratives. We are exploring museum quality monitors with audio capabilities to present curated stories to the public and are designing a dedicated space for customers to record video and audio narratives. Chat GPT update. In the library, Chat GPT has been used by, uh, by several teams, including IT staff, who effectively use it for tasks like code error correction, programming skill and ball improvement, and documentation enhancement. However, caution is needed when handling sensitive data, as Chat GPT is best suited for brainstorming and natural language debugging, complementing human expertise in critical thinking, adaptability, and security. The strategy division is establishing a work group uh, to explore artificial intelligence, AI, and machine learning, MI, ML, tools potential for improving efficiencies in communications and marketing. We're going to bring it on. Oh, we are? Okay. <laughs> Human resources. Are we, are we going to debate discussion? Yeah. Executive session. No, we're not voting now. We're voting not disappearing. <laughs> Sorry, Holbrook. <laughs> <laughs> Human Resources is actively investigating AIML's role in streamlining forms, processes, and policy verbiage for consistency and efficiency across the organization. The cross-departmental team responsible for the Story Center's technology and services has successfully utilized ChatGPT to create draft vision statements. Early ChatGPT implementation demonstrates enhanced productivity and problem-solving abilities. As we further explore AI ML applications, guidelines will be developed for appropriate use, considering uh, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, privacy, legal, and financial aspects. Uh, ChatGPT assisted in writing this section. <laughs> Congratulations, <laughs> nice work. <laughs> it, Paul I just hate that. I I really it, you have to <laughs> tell, you have to say that. Does it Otherwise, get, does it get it to work from home one day? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is it paying the city income tax? It better I be. That's air breath. I know, we have to ask Paul Brooks. Okay. Just that, that this sounds good. This the important yeah. part Are you getting, of like, good at using however, it? is that <laughs> it's like kind of tricky. Yeah. You don't put <laughs> you don't put personal or oh, no. or um, 
financial or anything that you want to keep to yourself because it is shared across the universe. It's oh. just language. It's yeah, best you do not friendly. want to put anything on there. Sure. You want to keep private. I do. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's very important. important to keep it. But nice work, whole book and team. And I turn it back over to you. All right. Retired that's judge. It's up to you. Yeah, okay. I mean, if you want to summarize. Okay, great. Okay, so she wants to know. Point of order there. Okay, so that's resolved. Yes. I would like to now turn things over to Ms. Clemens Lewis for the operations report. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Public Safety Initiatives Work Group. An internal public safety initiatives work group has been formed to address the insights gathered from the Library Journal Safety Summit held in April. The primary objective of this work group is to analyze the key takeaways from the summit and develop a comprehensive action plan to enhance public safety within our organization. The works group's focus includes implementing trauma-informed support strategies, establishing a continuous operation plan for effective emergency response, and identifying areas for improvement in our existing safety protocols. We are dedicated to ensuring a safe and secure environment for our customers and staff, and this, will, and this work group will play a vital role in achieving the objective. Free tax preparation, I'm going to summarize Paula, okay? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Free tax. So for the third year, this consecutive years, um, the library partnered in different locations with United Way of Greater Cincinnati to provide free tax prep services to individuals and family. We are pleased to report that the aggregate 2022 tax refund for our customers amounted to an impressive $838,421, representing a 22% increase in the number of taxpayers served compared to the previous sessions. This outcome would have definitely not been possible without support of our partner, United Way, which is a big contributor, and their collaborations and staffing all of the locations with volunteers. A question. It says yes, for families in need. So there so this free service is for is based is income based? Yeah. Well Okay. I, I mean, can't is it I so we can't use it. Well, I don't know if I didn't know that's yes, it's yeah. uh, treatment based and um, it's qualifying by income, but okay. we will assist anyone who needs help. Dying's not eligible. Turn your away, like so you what mean is, just a little too much. Yeah. Like, I'm not oh, what is this? I'm retired now. I'm retired now. Yeah, I could I'm be. Tired. Where are those locations? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have a new one out here in Great Town. Buy any township when it expands. Yeah. <laughs> That's all we're going to do out there. It's going to be in the floor. Right. Central is one of them. They're close. So, okay. so it is income. Okay. And what is the income limitation? Uh, that I'm not Whatever. sure. I can probably that, though. That's probably some percent of the yeah, probably we can find out. I'm sure. It's not. Yeah, it's probably some percentage of AMI. Yeah. But you yeah, know, right. just for like purposes of what we do yeah. at Urban Sites, I'd be interested yeah. to know to encourage point. my my tenants. Yeah. Oh. To, 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 to utilize to, to yeah. embrace that. Yes. And, and it's okay. awesome that they that we yeah, help it's a people. Great resource. Huge resource. We help people collect eight hundred thirty-eight thousand dollars, and it's a twenty-two percent increase from before. Now talk about services to the public again. You know, thank you, Paula. Executive Director. Thank you for all the staff. Oh my yeah, God. I mean, Kathy yeah, and her team really Kathy. work hard on um, doing that, and United Way is a great partner. I think this is an important what point for the June 19th. Yeah. Absolutely. Like the one that does IRS offer something for free on software online? Are they supposed oh, like to? versus like a, a turbo tax? Turbo tax yeah. yeah. One of the tax. Okay. okay. All right. Too many so. questions. Sorry. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Sorry. Are you still going? Okay. Yeah. I'm just waiting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you started started. Started. Yeah. Okay. Well, on the Hills I was branch. out of order. I was out of order. We're back in session. Now. Hosts the art display for Asian American and Pacific Islanders Month. Um, the Wanda Hills branch successfully hosted art from 10 different artists for Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Month. Mm -hmm. This initiative aimed to celebrate and honor the rich cultural contributions of the Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community. Several different mediums were included in the show, including paintings, carvings, printmaking, ceramics, and sculpture. The ex exhibition was organized by Yuling Hong and sponsored by CHPL, along with the Greater Cincinnati Chinese Cultural Exchange Association with support from the Asian American Cultural Association of Cincinnati. The events and lifelong learning the library actively participated in Memorial Day parades at several branches. The parades presented 
an opportunity to showcase our commitment to community engagement, honor veterans, and increase our visibility in our neighborhoods we serve. As you can mm -hmm. see the bullets for Discover Summer, um, which I believe we talked about this before, but is it digital now? It's both. Oh, because app that you can do. Oh, because I just go back to when I had to read the books and my mom had to sign off on them and I had to fill out the paper. <laughs> we we do have a paper. You have a paper, uh, a okay. Too, but so. I was telling her like it's digital now. Like you can just have an app yeah, and check and an make sure they're that. reading. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I as a school principal, I told my kids that too. Yeah. I'm like, there's an app for it because there there's an app for everything else. Yes. So those are the bullets to discuss to talk about discover summer. What's available. Um, Next is exciting upcoming programs and events included, as you can see, uh, June 15th. Um, annual Poetry in the Garden at Clifton. And then there's something at Walnut Hills and the Price Hill Branch. And there are other dates that are uh, coming up that have different activities planned as well. That concludes my report. Thank you for reporting. Yes, ma'am. Any, any comments or questions about that? Thank you, and, and moving along here to Mr. Harding to present the strategy report, please. Thank you, and this report was prepared by Beth Yoke, our Chief Strategy Officer. Um, moving on to the first topic, adult learning and literacy. The Adult Learning Center in-person daily program continues to provide customers with hands-on help with career goals, resumes, employment assistance, technology, and life skills. Our spring class attendance increased significantly over the same period from last year, up nearly 40%. Summer classes have started, and we are also offering nearly two dozen new classes. In addition to our regular ESOL and career focus series, we are offering 3D printing classes, TOEFL. I don't know. What is, what is that? to prepare is that? for um, your English proficiency? Okay, exam. okay, that's great. Uh, Arts Collective. Preparing, the US, uh, preparing for the U.S. citizenship ex uh, exam at the North Central Branch. And after the successful pilot at the Shelter House, uh, the Adult Learning Center will offer another six-week program this summer focusing on life skills and job training for their residents. Workforce development. We are celebrating In Demand Jobs Week in partnership with Ohio Means Jobs and the Workforce Council of Southwest Ohio, hosting a supply chain and transportation job fair at the Walnut Hills branch on May 4th. Uh, we also partnered with the city of Cincinnati's Department of Economic Inclusion to host an inclusionary job fair at the Walnut Hills branch on May 10th. Additionally, the city of Cincinnati's Department of Economic Inclusion asked us to be their featured DEI partner of the month, spotlighting our small business resources in their newsletter. Hamilton County also launched their new small business center with large scale small business resource expo at the Sharonville Convention Center in May, where we hosted a resource table to promote our small business resources and makerspace. We connected with more than 100 entrepreneurs at the expo. And that was a sold out event. Um, I don't know if anybody had the chance to go there, but um, I think we had eight, over 800 local uh, folks come to learn about how to start a business and, and learn more about resources that the county offers. So I'm glad we were able to participate in that. Partnerships on the Maine Library's North Plaza. The recently renovated North Plaza in Maine has been very active this spring. In early May, we hosted Hamilton County's 513 Relief Bus and provided connections to jobs and family services, rent and utility assistance, and youth empl employment programs. Services on the bus include free wellness checks provided by UC Health, Council on Aging Services, and addiction recovery services provided by Talbert House. On May 25th, we partnered with Turner Construction and Holden Hands uh, to provide a large community resource fair. The fair provided connections to resources such as addiction recovery services provided by the Urban League, record expungement by the Ohio Justice and Policy Center, free clothes and fresh produce provided by Holden Hands, health insurance and Medicaid navigation, and Cincy Animal Care provided free pet food and pet resources. Over 100 community members joined us and enjoyed the DJ, healthy cooking resources, and welcoming spaces and connections to services. Voter information. Uh, with the addition of the August election in Ohio, we are collaborating with the Greater Cincinnati Voter Collaborative on an effort to increase awareness about the newly scheduled election and the July 10th registration deadline for it. We are also updating our voter information webpage and seeking additional ways to inform 
community members about their right to vote and alert them to the changes to acceptable forms of voter ID. Spring Public Awareness Campaign. CHPL's Spring Public Awareness Campaign helped increase awareness of digital library materials. The campaign shared information about our e-resources and offered hands-on assistance through tech days at library locations. The campaign led to increased usage of our e-resources, e including Freegal, the music app, uh, which increased 14% from April to May, and 82% compared to May of 2022. Canopy use increased from 6% from April to May and 15% compared to last year. Creative Bug increased 13% from April to May and 125% compared to May of last year. And the number of book, book flicks sessions increased 32% from April to May and 70% compared to last year. During Tech Days, customers brought in their devices for help with loading apps like Libby e-reading app. Others had specific requests for assistance. For example, one customer wanted to learn about project management to prepare for an upcoming job interview. Staff provided the customer with resources through the LinkedIn Learning app. The campaign was supported through over 32,000 postcards sent to homes of older community members who are not yet library card holders and emails to 16, 000, over 16,000 existing customers. We have also revamped our new cardholder email campaign to include a focus on digital materials which has been sent to more than 800 cardholders with an open rate of over 59%. Uh, just a question or comment actually. Um, I find it amazing that um, we've only got 32,000 uh, folks who are not members of the library in the older community. Because mm -hmm. it went to 32,000 people in the older community. So that's a very, that means a whole lot of, that means everybody. I'm, well, I should be, be looking at myself. Uh, so it means everybody else has a library card, almost. That's got to be at least 100,000 people in Hamlin County. Maybe two. I sure hope so. Pardon? Yeah. Probably more. Probably more. Glad to have you, everybody. <laughs> Point All right, camera. continue. <laughs> camera. <laughs> the campaign yielded uh, 573,000, um, 335 impressions through paid social media and digital display advertising. The highest response was from the social media portion of digital advertising, which yielded the highest click-throughs from the 35 to 44-year-old female demographic segment who accessed the ads via mobile devices. Government services support. The spring staff were ta asked to track where they provided customers with government service support. More than 1,000 instances of support were recorded and the time spent helping customers was 720, 272 hours. Customers uh, needs fell into three categories, access to technology, assistance with using technology and getting help finding needed resources. Overall, our staff connected community members to at least 15 government agencies across the local, state, and federal levels. Customers sought assistance in areas of citizenship, civic engagement, finances, housing, judicial process, public safety, medical and health, social services, and workforce development. Our staff offer a great deal of value added in person assistance to seeking government service support. Based on our tracking, it is also clear how essential our help is to ensuring uh, to, to help those to navigate these services and processes. For example, just over 240 fax scans to Jobs and Family Services were sent by customers navigating the technology on their own, while more than 4,300 fax scans were sent by staff on behalf of customers. Awesome. And these statistics are likely a low estimate as having the opportunity to record statistics in a way that doesn't disrupt the delivery of excellent cu customer service isn't always possible. Mm -hmm. I think that's amazing. It's amazing. Advocacy training. Throughout the month of May, Library Customer Advisors, LCA, Library Customer Specialist, LCSs, and Youth Service staff participated in a training on library advocacy. Each session covered the, the way staff can incorporate library advocacy in their daily work by providing excellent customer service, as well as in the community and with elected officials. This training ensures frontline staff understand the importance of being an active library advocate 
and helps them feel comfortable and supported on their efforts to provide outstanding customer experiences and to raise awareness about all the resources the library has to offer. Outreach services. On May 5th, staff members Drew Pearson and Taylor Walpe, hopefully I said that right, along with Liz Foreman from Marketing visited the Hamilton County Courthouse. Currently, Outreach Services provides monthly collections for the jury room as well as the law library. The Friends of the Public Library also have a collection shelf in the jury room. Working with Jury Commissioner Brad Seitz and Friends Executive Director Alexia Loinich, please correct me if I'm saying that wrong, uh, we were able to add over 120 new items. These shelves are restocked monthly to ensure that those waiting in jury room will have access to a, a variety of genres. Marketing provided signage and bookmarks for newly refreshed collections. And, uh, and I appreciate what the staff has done <laughs> to make this happen. So, um, it, yeah, that's right. No, it, it's great. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased with this project and, and thankful for everybody that was involved in making it happen. So um, I, I've heard from Brad sites already that the jurors are loving it. Um, so That's it great. sounds like things are going well over there. Anything that makes jury service like fun. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Civic duty. Excellent. All right, and I'm going to turn things over to you, Ms. Reynolds, for the development report. Last report, the development committee. This report was prepared by Stacy Dennison. Thank you, Stacy. Um, always a lot of names in these reports, so please forgive me if I say something wrong. Uh, the Library Foundation, the spring giving campaign is underway. Results will be reported in an upcoming meeting. Exciting. Significant gifts have been received from the estate of Marilyn Steckel, the Kramig and Delisio Family Fund for the Blue Ash Branch, Casey and Bob Ruschman, Franklin Cromer, Anonymous for the Blue Ash Branch, Sandy and Peter Stern, and Sylvia Johnson. Additional grant requests have been submitted and are under review. On June 1st, the Cincinnati Estate Planning Council, in partnership with the Foundation and Library, hosted the Basics of Estate Planning for the Community. This first of its kind free workshop had 30 participants and was very well received. The plaque dedication for the Scott Ludecky Endowment at the North Central Branch Library is scheduled for June 15th. This permanent endowment fund was created in 2021. Annual proceeds from the fund are used to purchase early reader books and materials in memory of Scott that are circulated throughout the system, thanks to the generosity of his parents. Our Friends of the Public Library, at its most recent board meeting, the Friends of the Public Library approved $218,700 in support for the library. Over the next 12 months, these funds will support programs, the annual Books by Banks Festival, and much more. And the Anderson Township Library Association is hosting its 43rd summer sale on June 23rd through the 25th at the Nagel Middle School. The financial information presented in this report is not intended to tie the library financial information. Back to you, Jen. May I do one point and ask Stacy to announce uh, here the Stern Lecture uh, selection coming up because I think this report was written before that went broad and wide. So I know that many of our folks watching the trustees are also interested. Yeah, so on October 5th, uh, we will be hosting Isabel Wilkerson at the Aaron Arts Center for Performing Arts and as our next Stern lecture. Um, she has written the work of other sons and cast um, and is a really phenomenal Stern lecture. Any support you need from us? I can't quite hear what you're saying. Any support you need from us? Oh. Oh, well, yes. yeah. Tell your friends. <laughs> yes. Tell your friends, friends. and neighbors. Bring them back. Yes. We give the information to all of you as soon as we know what right. the sales are available. We'll make okay. sure. Said, oh, I, right. usually, I usually bring 10 people. Yes. How, do we, so we how do you say her last name? <laughs> Wilkerson? Oh, Isabel Wilkerson. And I don't think you. Look. There are many book clubs that are going to be happening. So oh. join the book club, join the discussion, uh, and do it for your life. Yes, Stacy's been working with um, Holbrook, who does oversee the collections, and they've been trying to activate that work along with the service to make sure that people are aware. And now that we're out of the pandemic, have gotten the chance to get together and read and talk about the books. Excellent, excellent. And I now need a, a motion to for approval of the consent items, and I'll move that motion. Move that motion. Second. Okay. All in favor. Aye. 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 And I now need a motion of voice, a vo a voice to vote to approve the uh, adjournment. Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Oh, this is great. I so know. much information. Thank you.